Good morning. I love that song. It is, it's, it's a good one. I want to thank Dan Kramer. That, that was a very eye-opening uh, uh, Sunday school lesson, although he did bring something up about, uh, uh, you know, Christ dying for the cosmos, for society. Um, I think there's something we have to remember. This was asked to me between, between studies here. And if you remember, uh, I looked it up in my little concordance at the back of my Bible. The Lord Jesus said in Luke chapter uh, 19, verse 10, I've come to seek and save that's that which was lost. And I'm going to submit to you that the Gentiles were not lost. They were never in a relationship with God to be lost from. That's why when you read the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, my son, he was lost now he is what? Now he is found, you see, and that's just an illustration of that. But I'm reminded in uh, Romans chapter number uh, 15 that our Lord Jesus Christ was made a minister to Israel, to the circumcision, it says there. And then as you read the verses underneath, it says that the Gentiles might glorify God, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we understand that Abraham, uh, the, the Abrahamic covenant has to do with uh, uh, Abraham and his, those progeny come after him would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. OK. And of course, under the new covenant. And I don't know if I dare say the Lord said that uh, uh, salvation is of the Jews to the woman at the well. You all remember that? So that's the, the, the Jews that entered into the new covenant. They were to take that message out. And of course, that's what happened during the Acts period with the disciples and the apostles and that sort of thing. And now it has come to us and we praise the Lord for that. So let's do this. Let's turn over, uh, turn your Bible over to First Thessalonians chapter number two, please. First Thessalonians chapter number two. I'm going to read a few of the verses. Um, in fact, I'll, I'm going to read the first 12 13 verses here, 13 verses to get us going on our Bible study. And um, I call this personal colon relationship is what I'm uh, uh, calling this message. So let's read. Uh, verse one says, and I'm using the ESV this morning. For you yourselves know, brothers, that out <coughs> coming to you, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not of not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our our labor and toil, we work night and day that we might not be burdened to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. For we, I'm sorry, for you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom in glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what is really it, what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Now, in verses one to seven, what we're going to note this morning is this very basically that Paul is going to put forth light 
concerning his ministry and that of Timothy and Silas. All right. And evidently what happened is this, that people were slandering Paul and his group there in Thessalonica. And so Paul feels led for the sake of the uh, Thessalonians to uh, speak of this, to address this and bring certain things to light so that they'll understand exactly what was happening, what is happening there in Thessalonica at, at this time. So that these folks don't lose faith in the gospel and particularly in the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore can continue on in their faith and their service toward uh, our great God and Savior. So Paul and his associates, if what, what I want to sum up what these uh, slanders were talking about is this. Paul and his associates are diluted individuals who for selfish reasons, reasons and with trickery are trying to exploit the people. This, therefore, this charge had to be answered so that these suspicions could be put clearly in front of these people and they'll understand what's going on. So the bottom line, I believe, is this, and this is something that's happened throughout history uh, with, with people. When a message comes, there's always going to be an opponent, whether it's spiritual, political, or whatever. This might be even within a family, all right? When, when a message comes that has opponents, most of the time what the opponents will do is not go after the message. Not at all. What they'll do is go after the messenger. And they hope by going after and destroying the messenger that by nature and by time, the message will just meet its death. And that's what's happening here. So Paul's going to attack this. He had no choice because his love for the gospel, his love for the Lord Jesus Christ, and his love for these people demanded he answer the charges that are being made against him. So notice with me verse number one, and let's start right there. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. It was not in vain. Now, usually when you think of the word vain, what do you think of? Empty. empty. Something is empty. It has no value or anything. I think we, what we need to understand is this. When Paul came to these folks, he's telling them through his writings that I didn't come empty handed. I didn't come to take anything. I came to give something. So his hands were full. And what were they full of? The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, you see. He came to give something, not to take something. Notice with me verse 5, if you would. Verse 5. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for what? For greed. And God is a witness to that. Then verse number 9, please. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. So Paul didn't come to take anything at all. He came not in vain, but with something to give. And not even to the fact that they should take care of him in any aspect, but he was working night and day so he can continue to preach what? The gospel to these dear people, all right? So once this point is seen in the chapter here, everything that flows is not difficult to understand, okay, as we go here. So when we come to verse 2, it says, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully entreated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God. Now notice what it says, in the midst of much what? Conflict. Now we know conflict followed Paul wherever he had been. Say, and we already talked about what happened to him in Philippi. But let me read you something that, that, from one of my commentaries, and I don't read, I didn't mark it down. It says, But for Paul, the physical suffering was not the worst part of the treatment he received in Philippi, if you'll remember that. Paul more strongly resented that they had been shamefully treated. So he was grievously insulted. Gross iniquities had been heaped upon them in a way they had been treated. They were arrested on false charge, if you remember that. They were stripped of their clothing. 
and publicly beaten without a trial and thrown into the inner prison with their feet in the stocks as though they were the most dangerous criminals. The stocks were for those that were murderers and that, those sort of people, insurrectionists. And that's where Paul ended up, you see. When, when, when you look at that, it was a sad situation. They had suffered not only bitter cruelty, but public humiliation. Paul was deeply conscious that his social status as a Roman citizen had been outraged. This treatment accorded them uh, was contrary to Roman law. His desire to reverse this mistreatment caused Paul to demand that the Philippian magistrates come and personally uh, conduct them or conduct them out of prison, according to Acts chapter 16, verse 37, if you remember the story. So Paul's insertion here of the words, as you know, are very important. For with this, with this statement, he's indicating not only his sufferings, but the sufferings that the Thessalonians are going through as well, all right? And he had a strong desire to carry to his readers the full implication of what was happening, not only in his life and Silas's life and Timothy's life, but with their lives also in the midst of much conflict. Now you wonder, have you ever wondered this? How in the world did they realize what happened to him in Philippi? Did people run down prior to Paul and Silas and Timothy and give an account of what these, these folks had done? No, I don't believe that at all. They were scourged. I've never been scourged. I've read many, read many stories because of my, my bent in the history of sailing ships and that in the, in the wars of the 17 and 1800s. And I, I see in the British Army or Navy that they would scourge men for certain things. Right. And most of the time, scourging led to death. It was really sad. And what I see with Paul and Silas in jail there, they were scourged. And a short time later, where did they end up? In Thessalonica. I wonder if they were healed yet, if their backs were healed. Probably not. And so their movements, you say, and their interaction with the people there in Thessalonica would indicate to these dear people in Thessalonica that, hey, we went through something. And that's why he can say here, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated, he can say at the end of the verse, in midst of much conflict, not only the conflict that Paul had in Philippi, but now because of the people that followed Paul down the Thessalonica and the Thessalonians themselves uh, persecuting, if you want to say that, the believers there, remember they, they came out of what? The Thessalonians, paganism. They were all idolaters, and that was part of their total society, if you remember the last message we, we saw. And so what they did, they, they gave up family and friends and maybe jobs, who knows, to become believers in Jesus Christ. And because of it, they were persecuted, you see. They were persecuted. We have to, uh, we have to remember that. So they had boldness, though, in our God, boldness to declare what? The gospel. The gospel. Notice chapter one with me, verses five to seven. Let's go back there. Because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power and the Holy Spirit with full conviction, knowing what kind of men we prove to be among you. Say that's why he can come back and say, God is our witness in a little, a little later here. OK, then verse six. It says, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much what? Affliction. See, so when he says in conflict in verse number two of chapter two, he's already mentioned at one time that they were af afflicted in verse six of chapter one with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Go figure that one. So that you became an example to all the believers of Macedonia and Acacia. And when you compare that with verse number 13, where they received the word and they received it how? As the word of God and not of men. All right. And so you can see why they were willing to go through these afflictions, these uh, conflicts in life here. And Paul is uniting them with himself. 
say, as, as one unit there, in unity, if you'd like to say that, in terms of the gospel. And if you paid attention while I was reading down through uh, chapter number two, the gospel is mentioned three times at least, four times actually. The gospel, that's the center of everything that we see in our unity. Now, what we find when we go to verse number three, then, is this. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to do what? To deceive. So you have three things here or three charges leveled against Paul and his group. Okay? Three charges. The first one, it says, from error. Notice that from error, meaning from delusion. These people are delusional. <laughs> that was the charge against them. All right. And, and you hear that quite often, but watch what happens. Come back to Acts with me, would you? And chapter 26, please. Acts chapter 26, if you would. Okay. Acts chapter 26. Be with you in just a second. Let's notice verse 20. Four. Here I believe uh, Paul is standing uh, with, with Festus, and verse 24 says, And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. Today we say he was delusional, but he followed a pattern. What pattern? Well, let's go over to, uh, let's see. I have to turn the page for this. Uh, I'm sorry. Let's go over to Mark chapter 3, please. Mark chapter 3. All right. Mark chapter 3. I think this is very interesting. I once did a message on this years ago. But in Mark chapter 3, let's notice, please, verse number twenty. Uh, 21, but we'll start in chapter, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 20. This is just after the names of the 12 apostles are given. And in Mark 3, 20 says, Then he went home, speaking of our Lord, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. I mean, they, they were squeezed into the house. And having a hard time at the, the table to eat, eat anything here, all right? And when his family heard it, now who was his family? At this time, be Mary, his brothers and sisters, right? And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he is out of what? Who are they speaking of here? This is the Lord's family speaking of him. So not only Paul, but our Lord was accused of being out of his mind. And by his own what? Family, and you, I can almost visualize that in, in, in terms of the uh, Thessalonians. I remember when, when I was saved, I, I got excited. And I've given my testimony many times. But the first person I called was my mother. I was in Jacksonville, Florida. She was in Erie, Pennsylvania. And I told her what had happened, what transpired. And she said, oh, Danny, that's just a phase you're going through. In other words, you're... Delusional. And praise the Lord. I heard my dad got saved at a later date. Okay. But Christian standards, folks, can be different from the standards of the world. And those who follow them with a single purpose and a burning enthusiasm, enthusiasm appear to others to be off their rockers. In other words, we are believers in Jesus Christ. We walk worthily. We pray, right, as Paul has written, okay, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we've been called, and that walk is different than the walk of the world. You know, I find it interesting. I, where, where, I, where I work, I work with uh, uh, four younger people. The oldest is, is 25, the youngest is 19. And they always ask me questions about life. I've been around longer, you know. And one of them, it, it always revolves around getting married and, and, and that sort of thing and getting serious. And I always give them this advice, wait till you're 39 or lonely, whichever comes last. Now, that was advice given to me, but I never took it to heart, you know. But they, they ask questions. And the reason they do is they know I'm a minister of the gospel. 
and the world they live is different than mine. And so they're looking for something. And so we try to share that with them, say, we try to share that with them. So the first thing is he was delusional. Second thing was, had to do with the impure uh, uh, motives, okay? Impure motives here as, as we look at this. Uh, uh, error or impurity, verse number three. Impurity, that brings you to the idea of, of sexual impurity. And I think the reason that Paul mentions this is because back in chapter 5 and, and verse 26, he's going to tell the folks, greet each other how? With a holy kiss. And, and I remember very definitely when I was a, a young Christian and I had been transferred up to Eagle Harbor, Michigan, and we were in a, a, a Baptist church up there, and uh, the preacher had mentioned this verse in, in, in his teaching. And afterwards, everybody was given everybody a holy kiss. And this young woman came up to me to give me a holy kiss, and her, her husband grabbed her by the back of the neck and says, no, no men. <laughs> she said, said to her, you know, in other words, give it to the ladies, but not the men. And so the idea here has to do with a, a sexual uh, impurity. So a, a holy kiss, what would go through their minds? See, one thing leads to another. Uh, in fact, I wrote this down and, and, you know, oftentimes people tell me or say, man, the world is getting worse and worse and worse. Well, come back to Genesis with me, please. Uh, when it comes to this sort of thing. Come back to Genesis chapter number six. Let me read you two verses here. Genesis chapter number six. Notice with me four, uh, five and six, five and six. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord did what? regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Listen, at this time, God knew who the adversary was, always did, right? But doesn't mention him here. Who's he mentioned? Man. And what's man like to do in relationship to their evilness? Who do Christians do? They blame the devil for it. They blame demons for it. They have nothing to do with it. Man's heart, say, as you, as you read this, okay? That's the whole situation here. The wickedness was so great on the earth that every intention of the thoughts of his hearts was only evil continually. Is man any different now? No. Same man that we see. Richard has a... Well, I was just going to say that the people that uh, those two verses, evil thoughts, like 100% of the time, I think they be worse than that. I mean, obviously That's right. And it's just, it's just a big circle that this earth or world society of men has gone through one, one after another. It's a sad situation. Read Romans 1 if you think it's, you know, that, that goes along with Genesis chapter number 6. And I think we have to see that. And we have to understand that. And even as some things God gave men over to a depraved mind. Okay, that's what they want. All right, go ahead with it. Yeah. Nothing new under the sun. You're right about that. So impure motives. All right. Then deluding others. We see there in verse number three, uh, attempting to deceive, to dilute. So we're back to First Thessalonians chapter number Number two, all right? So attempting to deceive. So they're saying Paul is a propagandist. It's not real. And what is, what is the old line? If you tell a lie long enough, sooner or later people start believing it as truth. And so that's how they're looking at Paul here, all right? That's how they're looking at him. So when we come to verse number four, Notice what we, we see here, verse number four. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. So why is Paul write this? Because they were being accused of pleasing men. See? Pleasing men. Now, who would do this? Well, probably the Jews that came down and followed Paul. That's why it would come up. But approved by God? How would they know they, that, that Paul and his group were approved by God? 
Well, we, that comes up later on. How did they receive the word that Paul gave? As by God. See? So they recognized these men were sent by God to us to give us this message so that we could turn from idols. See? Idols are nothing, Paul says. And he probably preached that and taught them that. Wherein God is everything. He is the creator and everything else. All right? So approved by God. And then it says <laughs> about to God, who tests our what? Our hearts. And what is evil in men? Their minds and their hearts. When it came to the circumcision business, what was the bottom line of that? Circumcise their hearts back in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant. And that's what we see here. And so that's what, that's what, that's what Paul is looking at. Listen, there's always people, and I'll say this, and I, I want to laugh on the inside, but it, it's a serious thing. There's always people who think to be religious, you have to be unhappy. Why? Because religion puts you under law, 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 law. Got to do this, this, that, and that. Uh, the Christianity is coming up to what we call Lent. And most of your churches are going to do what? They're going to have things to do with Lent. Do what? Give this, give this, give this, give this. They put themselves under the law. You put yourself under the law, what do you become? Unhappy. No joy. These people were, uh, when, when, when you look at once, but the afflictions, okay, with the joy. Yeah, back in chapter one, verse number six, the word and much, they receive the word and much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Not the condemnation of the law that makes somebody unhappy, see? So keep that in mind as you're going through here. So the gospel of Paul was a gospel, he's giving it out for free. I mean, if something's for free, I, you ought to consider it. I think I told you the story about Susan and I down in, down in Erie when we went for Thanksgiving to uh, meet my daughter and my gr granddaughter at, at, at uh, Dave Evans for Thanksgiving meal. And, and in order to do that and get across the state line, I had to uh, go for business reasons. So I went to the warehouse down there in Erie that uh, our business has. And, and here I am getting a couple boxes and switching boxes over. And a guy comes over to me. He says, hey, those tires look good. How'd you like two brand new ones? And I go, sir, I don't have any money for new tires. He says, I'm going to give them to you. My heart was joyful. There was almost 400 and some dollars there that was given that I could use for my van. And the reason he gave them, he was cleaning out his unit because he had just bought two new cars and he didn't want to be bothered with the tires. So praise the Lord with joy, right? But yet when it comes to, to, to the gospel, that's how we should be, joy. And Christianity a lot of time isn't. So then we come to verse 5. Watch what he says. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with pretext for greed. God is witness, he says. Now, how do we know that? Notice verse 9. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We work night and day that we might not be burden a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. So Paul and his group did what? They labored. And we know Paul was a tent maker. I don't know what Silas and Timothy did, might, might have helped them, but that's what we see. So they weren't there to get any money from these people or anything. I found this, and let me read this to you. I don't know how to pronounce the word right, but one of the first Christian books ever written and I won't even give you the Latin word, but it means this, the teaching of the 12 apostles. It was written around 100 AD. Notice what it says here, because it's very illuminating instructions with the, with the uh, responsibility of a teacher with his students. All right, watch what it says here. Let every apostle that comes to you be received as the Lord, and he shall stay one day. And if need be, the next also. But if he stays three days, he's a false prophet. And when the apostle goes forth, let him take nothing save bread until he reaches his lodging. But if he asks for money, he is a false prophet. No prophet that orders a table in the spirit shall eat of it, lest he is a false prophet. 
And we're looking at lodging and food and money here. False prophet, right? If he, if he that comes is a passerby, help him as far as you can. But he shall not abide with you longer than two or three days unless there is a necessity. But if he is minded to settle among you and be a craftsman, let him work and eat. What did Paul do? He worked. So he could eat, so he could preach the gospel, say. But if he has no trade, according to your understanding, provide that he shall not live idle among you, being a Christian. But if he will not do this, he is a Christ monger. In other words, he's just using Christ to live on. Okay? Paul, later on in First Thessalonians, is going to say, if he doesn't work, a man doesn't work, he shouldn't what? He shouldn't eat, right? But if he will not do this, he's a Christ monger. Of such men, beware. Now, the date of this writing is about 100 A.D. And even the early church knew the constant problem of those who traded on charity. They came in for one purpose, say, to take, to take, to take. And Paul says, we haven't done that. So when I come to verse number six, it says, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. See, they were accused of seeking personal prestige, promoting themselves. Okay, if Paul would have written a book at that time, a book, not a letter at that time, and had it published, see, they would accuse him of trying to, Sell the book to make money, all right? But, of course, that didn't happen, okay? It did not happen. Notice verse 5 of chapter 1 one more time, because this is interesting. Verse 5 of chapter 1, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. Now watch what he says. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your what? For your sake. Now notice verse 8. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Acacia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say what? Say anything. Because not only did Paul give them the word, but he gave himself to the people. And that's the key. It wasn't a one-night stand, if you please, or two or three. He came, gave him the word, and that's how we see that. I want to I read something to you out of the Passion Translation. It's in 1 John, if you want to go back there in your Bible. 1 John, chapter number, uh, uh, 2 John, I'm sorry, 2 John, so there's no chapter 3. 2 John, verses 3 through 6. Now, I like the Passion Translation. I, I read it as a devotional. Uh, it expands on, on normal translations. But in, in 2 John, verse 3 says, Grace, mercy, and peace belong to us. They belong to us. Flowing from the presence of God the Father and from Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, and from the realm of true love. That's how, that's how grace, mercy, and peace peace come from the realm of true love it says then i go to the next verse verse four i was delighted and filled with joy when i learned that your children are constantly living in the truth just as we have received the command from the father dearest woman I have a request to make of you. It is not a new commandment, but a repetition of the one we have had from the beginning, that we constantly, listen to this, constantly love one another. Constantly love one another. This love means living in obedience to whatever God commands us. For to walk in love toward one another is the unifying commandment we've heard from when? From the beginning, say, from the beginning, constantly. That's been the message of our Lord Jesus Christ, say, and those who followed him, that love business, not anything to do with seeking personal prestige. And I might just interject. Let, let me put a parenthesis in here. Who was, who, who was Second John written to? Is your Bible still open? Who is it written to? 
It's in the first verse. The elect lady and her children. Now, now in a lot of the commentaries, they, they say the elect lady is a metaphor for the church, the body of Christ. And that could be. But I've read other writings and commentaries, not Roman Catholic, by the way, that say that lady could have been Mary. Could have been Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And so you, you never know. Being reminded, though, to constantly what? Be loving. So it's, it's just a thought that came by. So when we go back to 1 Thessalonians again, notice with me verse number 7. Okay, verse number 7, please. But we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of what? Her own children. You know, Paul was accused of being a dictator of sorts. And he, he then equates himself, listen, I, you know, as a mother takes care of the, a nursing child, a small child, back in those days, the nursing might have lasted three or four years, but still was a, a small child. Paul says, that's, that's where I am. His gentleness was of a wise father, as we see down uh, a little further in verse number 11. For you know how like a father with his children, Okay, a father with his children. So his love was in no way easy or sentimental, right? Paul understood that the believers needed to be, watch the word, disciplined. Okay, not for punishment, but for the good of their souls, for the good of their character. Uh, Hebrews, uh, let me turn over to Hebrews, and I'll read this to you. Chapter 12, verse 6, for the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. He keeps them straight, in other words, okay? He keeps them straight. If you go to, and you don't have to do this, but write it down if you're taking notes, all right? Hebrews, uh, Hebrews Psalms 119, verses 65 to 68, and then 71 and 72 both hit on this subject, okay? So when I come to verse number 10, here in Second Thess or First Thessalonians chapter number two, when I come to number ten, it says this: "You are witnesses. Who are witnesses? The Thessalonians are witnesses, not just the Thessalonians and God. What also? So you're a witness to everything I've said, and God is a witness to everything I've said." How holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. Paul and Silas and Timothy were above board in everything. And all these things that were slanders against Paul and these accusations against uh, Paul, he notes them right here when he writes back to them. And you'll remember what happened. They weren't in Thessalonica very long, and they had to leave again. But Paul down in Athens then sends Timothy back to Thessalonica. If you remember, we, we studied that because Paul couldn't get there himself. And we'll see that here next, next time we get together. Okay. So what happens is Timothy's bringing this information back to Paul about what's being said about them. So he writes to these dear folks. Okay. He, he writes to them and it's all about his conduct toward them. They were Righteous, holy, righteous, and blameless was our con, uh, conduct towards you. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you, exhorted, number one, encouraged you, number two, and charged you, number three, to do what? What says it? To walk in a manner worthy of God. Now, what's that mean? Okay, love. Basically, what it means is this. Worthy of somebody is mean that you're in harmony with them. Think of those that are your closest friends. Why are they? Because you're in harmony with them. Say, in harmony with them. And so what's Paul telling these Thessalonians here? Hey, you are a witness, and God's a witness. And like a father, I am doing what here? What, what does he say? I'm encouraging, okay, exhorting, encouraging 
you and charging you to walk in a manner worthy of God. See, a manner in harmony with God. That's what Paul's looking for for these people, because he's just said that he's done that. Hey, we're holy, we're righteous and blameless in our conversation with you, in our, in our witness with you. That's how we are. And so to walk worthy means that we're walking in harmony with God. And why is that when you, when you read this? Say, who calls you, notice what it says in verse 12, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. What can be better than that? In Colossians, Paul is going to tell us that we've been translated there. He's called us there. We're there. Now, our problem is still the age-old promise problem I've been trying to talk about for the last month or so. Okay, flesh versus what? Spirit. I'm in the kingdom right now. I'm walking in his kingdom right now, right where I am. See? And we have to get a realization of that. Who calls you into his own kingdom and glory? Come over to, uh, I'm going to close up here. Come over to 2 Timothy, please, in chapter 4. Who calls you? We're going to pick this up in verse 13, down through the end of the chapter in our, our next study. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18, it says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his what? Heavenly kingdom, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. These could be the last words that are penned after, you know, from here to 22 of the scripture. Because Paul says it was given to him to complete this. So think about this. He's going to be delivered. He's looking for that. And what was he teaching the Thessalonians? Same thing every chapter, given that. I'm going to go to the Passion Bible one more time. And I'm going to uh, turn over to uh, Colossians chapter 3 with me. Colossians chapter 3. Okay. Colossians chapter number 3. Let me read you the first, or the first four verses of this chapter. Okay. Watch what it says here. Now listen to what I'm saying along as you're going along. Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. How do I know that? Romans 6 tells me that. Right? This is why we are to yearn. Now listen. This is why we are to yearn for all that is above. For that's where Christ sits enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. Yes. Now, this isn't in your Bible, and it's, it, it's italicized here. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm. And fill your thoughts with heavenly realities, and not with the distractions of this natural realm. Your crucifixion with Christ, verse 2, actually, actually verse 3, has severed the ties to this life. And now your true life is hidden away in God, in Christ. And as Christ himself is seen for whom he really is, who you really are will also be revealed, for you are now one with him in glory. What are you saying this morning, Brother Dan? Paul suffered physically and in the mind. And the suffering of the mind bothered him more than the physical suffering. And the evil of men is always there. And we have to perceive ourselves, as I believe he's trying to teach these dear people in Thessalonica. Okay? He's exhorting and encouraging and charging them to be in harmony with God. That's what this whole deal is about, folks. Whether it was AD 58, 65, or 2021, in harmony with God. What we have to do is get away from the thinking of the flesh and think of the spirit. The spirit dwells within us, does he not? Sure he does. And those things of God are there. Keep it in mind as we walk. So we're going to sing one more song.